next group of speakers. Because that's what uniquely identifies this particular John Smith. 
Now, John Smith is a little challenging. If we look back real quick, uh, the first two John Smiths are both John W. Smith, which can be hard to distinguish between. So we pretty quickly realized that a simple autocomplete field is not the best way to go. So we now add in extended context. So again, so now it's starting to look a little more like Sanofia. My first example was from a Samvera application. Um, so you start typing in a name in the LOC names field here, Sam Taylor, and what you get back now is uh, information about Sam Taylor. There's three fields, URI, ID, and label, plus a whole bunch of additional context about them. The authoritative label, the variant label, birth date, death date, maybe some other information as well. Um, and I'm just showing one entry here because now they're longer, because there's this extended context for each uh, matching entity. So now, when we present this to the user, they, not just, they don't just get the label, uh, Sam Taylor, but they get, who is Sam Taylor? When was he born? When did he die? What kind of occupation does he, do, does he have? And in this, I like this particular example because in our top five Sam Taylors, three of them had really good detail with having the occupation, and all three occupations are completely different. And so in this case, this would be very easy for the user to go, oh, I'm looking for Sam Taylor, the college teacher who is a creative writer. I'm not looking for the one who's the jazz musician. And again, when they select those, Sam Taylor goes in the field when they select a Sam Taylor. And again, behind the scenes, we keep that URI because we want to know that specific Sam Taylor. So, um, as we developed our use cases, we came to yet one more, where now we don't want to just fill in one field, we actually want to fill in a whole bunch of fields. So in QA, you can make a query, which that's what we've been looking at. We make a general query with a string, and we get back uh, several possibilities to choose from. You can also say, I want one specific uh, piece of uh, information about a single entity. So, uh, this is not in Synopia yet, so these next few screens are my made-up uh, implementation of this. So you just have to take it with a grain of salt. Um, so all I put on this one is magic happens. So somehow you did a search, you figured out which shared DD entity you want, and um, coming back from QA now is the full JSON LD of the entire graph of everything we know about that particular shared BDE entry. And so now, I can use that to fill in multiple fields. So in this particular example, I have filled in the title, Mark Twain. The author is Leon, I'm not going to pronounce that, uh, name, and the, the publisher is uh, Bayard in Paris, and an OCLC identifier, and there's a whole bunch more information in that particular JSON-LD that I could have filled in as well. Um, so this is going to facilitate <coughs> certain uh, use cases like cloning and copy cataloging. Um, we're looking at doing this, so this example was with shared UDE, we're looking at doing this with LOC, and there's also a project in LD4P um, that is going to be doing it with Discogs. Um, so we might look at some others as well that want to be able to populate multiple fields. So that's uh, coming up in, I think, work cycle five of Synopia before it will be ready um, to make use of this. So the functionality exists in uh, QA now, but it will be ready to be used at a later date. Um, so I just wanted to give you a sense of what uh, uh, authorities that we've already put in place and that we have access to today. So that's the full list. Um, some authorities allow you, they have an API that is consistent with our code and we can do direct access straight to those authorities. Um, in general though, I will tell you that we mostly are working with our cache. And Dave's going to talk a little bit more about why that is when uh, he comes up, because there are some things that the cache can do that we can't really do with the direct access. And you'll notice that for some of those direct accesses, they only say they do term fetch. So we can't search them and get back RDF. And so that's already a limitation um, right there. Uh, so, pretty close to eight. So I, I'll show you real quick a couple of, um, one of the things that we did as part of this project is we, we wrapped the QA server with a, a, a UI that allows you to do a couple of things that just make your life a little easier if you're maintaining this server yourself. One is to get a list of all the 
uh, authorities that are supported and with sample URLs so you can sort of test things out. The other is that you can do a connection test. One of the things that happened early on is someone would try to access a particular authority, the authority was down. And we didn't know, did they not get any data back because the authority was down, or did we not get data back because their query didn't match anything? And so it gave them a way to do a quick connection test and see what, what the status was. Uh, we also have accuracy tests that we're using in order to tweak the indexing. Um, so it basically does a check to see, I have a specific query I'm going to execute. I expect a particular URI to be in the results. And I expect it to be in, in this case, I expect it to be in the top 10. And it actually showed up as the first. So that's, that's pretty good. Um, but that if it didn't, then it would be something we would want to look at the indexing to see why is it not showing up. And then we also have a documentation for our API. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave. So this is actually going to be a bit of a systems engineering discussion as much as anything. Um, so the cache versus direct access, um, as Lynette was mentioning, many of these sources only provide bulk dumps of the data or only allow you to do term fetch. Um, and even more so, given what we're trying to do with presentation of, of the information, none of these, Sparkle is a very good example of this, um, do ranked results. Sparkle's a blue bean result. You either are a match or you're not a match. There's no notion of fitness of the match. So um, we needed to do something there. And then even more so, um, there was this question of helping an interface user disambiguate what they're looking at by means of these um, context issues. So um, there's all of that. Plus, there's the whole notion of some of these endpoints, even if they're an endpoint, are dog slow. Uh, because you've got a half a million people trying to use it across the world. So, um, and the, the users get very whiny when stuff comes back. So, so um, I have the, um, it, the um, privilege, advantage, ability to avoid our technical services group by running my own servers in my own space, um, run my own storage, so I can basically tune the platform at will. Um, this comes back to the systems engineering um, um, perspective. But that's because I used to be a systems administrator, and they trust me, and they give me my own domain names, and just so long away. Um, you also end up feeding into a bunch of other stuff, but the challenge really comes in some of the synchronization stuff. It takes a while to reload a billion triples into a triple store. It also takes a little bit of memory as it's doing all the sorting if you were trying to do um, uh, Apache Jenna triple store load, which means that real-time updates get a little bit challenging when it takes you a day just to download the dump from the site, let alone load it into the triple store. So um, what we're currently configured as, and this is really meant for a long-term engineering solution, um, we use Apache HTTP on the front end. Virtual hosting allows us to play games particularly with respect to load balancing and having fallback servers. Um, the actual services pages are configured as Java server pages within a Tomcat container. And we actually do have replicated configurations. There's a primary one, if that one's down, it falls back to the secondary. And then um, underneath that is two instances of the Apache Fuzeki um, running against the raw triple storage. And both Tomcat instances can talk to both triple stores. All right, so what happens then is a request comes in, coming back to the ranked question, we actually build a Lucene index, primarily the URI, the label we're going to use for a human interface response, and a blob of text that we use for the full text indexing. Uh, depending upon the use case, we might pull in all of the prep or all the labels and again, this is part of the tuning of what constitutes uh, a match against the system. And then the Lucene index rankings give us the ability to inject a rank triple into the result for a given match to allow us to say this was the top hit, this is the second hit, and so forth. Um, each of those URIs are then used to run a um, 
service-specific Sparkle query. And since um, Josh showed the command line stuff, I get to show you uh, Sparkle queries. Um, um, and then those triples coming back from the Sparkle query typically are cached into an in-memory triple store so that you can do some pretty messy stuff like constructs or multiple queries in sequence to build the final result. And then that in-memory triple store is just dumped out as a result coming back to Lynette. So this is what it looks like typically. Um, JSP has got the ability to write um, custom tag libraries. And if you've ever used JSP, there's a SQL tag library that's built into it. So I authored, or I basically in desperation, wrote my own tag library that wraps all of the Zeki stuff. Um, here's a case where we select basically just a very simple set of give me all the triples with a given subject, um, which is actually cut and pasted out of one of our services. So some of the service requests are relatively simple. And then the iterator at the bottom just says, walk through the result set and spit them back out. A little bit more complicated, and this is actually another live one, um, where the context becomes something that gets really nasty to work on. Actually, just solve the problem where we bang our heads for the last uh, couple of weeks on doing context for LOC names, where we're trying to pivot through the real world object links and pick up things like field of activity and occupation. But the prospect is this is basically, you could cut and paste this query into a Zeki endpoint, it would run. The prospect of what happens with that, because you can't iterate through a complex result set like this, is that's where that caching comes into play. The graph tag at the top is indicating here, at the top of this one, that instead of the results just coming back to the interface, they're going to be stored in a thing, in this case, a variable called graph. And then we can actually query that in-memory triple store to retrieve everything that matched. And this is where we can avoid having to worry about the shape of the response graph coming back. And basically go for a standard iteration to dump the results out. Now, what this gives us is a whole bunch of different controls to play with. So from the perspective of what constitutes a good match versus a poor match, We've got the ability to play games with tokenization of the query input, the relative weighting of terms. If you want to push, say, the pref label heavier, you can pump the weight up on that versus the alt labels. And then the semantics of the query, and we get into conflicting issues here because partial matches are good, but the, um, the catalogers frequently want every term to match exactly. So we've got the ability to flip a disjunction, conjunction switch on the terms that are appearing in this. At the Pizeki endpoint level, this is where we can basically shape that response graph. Pretty much it will, because we're writing the Sparkle select or the Sparkle construct um, query to match that particular requirement. Which is interesting because we've got queries that are a page long, and the users are whining, remember? So that stuff's got to come back fast. It, the, the thing that we found intriguing about this is we've got an open source stack. We're using off-the-shelf open Apache HDP, off-the-shelf Tomcat, and the Apache Jenna project for this, and we can get one-second response times against a billion triple triple stores. Um, you just have to write good queries, and we discovered that writing bad queries for some of these things <laughs> means that they really never come back because they're trying to basically give you the entire so um, there was a question early on about source code access and so forth. Um, the first block up there are the QA um, GitHub um, repositories. And the bottom group, the top one is the web app, and then two supporting tag libraries are available. The tag library one, if you want to be able to just pick that up and use it against an arbitrary, arbitrary triple store, it's actually a very nice little standpoint.
really have a question. I must say, as someone who's working in this area very much also, these two presentations have been spectacular, really. But what you're doing is very, very interesting. And I want to know when I can access the QA to uh, uh, so that is that that's a new to our right. server that is running Q, QA and it has access to the cache system, it also has access to several of the direct authorities as well. And the only the only caveat I do is oh, I'm sorry, we'll be Yes. Uh, so I see this is the link to our server that is available now. And uh, the only caveat I was going to say is that uh, it's great for exploration, and anyone is welcome to go and use it to explore. I don't recommend it for production, only because as we change things, we don't have a notification system to let people know that we're going to make changes. We just change it, because it's part of our ongoing project. And if we're willing, we're going to experiment, though, with Oh, yeah, you can absolutely experiment with it. And, and also, like the links that were on the previous slide take you to the code, so you could set up your own QA server. Uh, the setting up the QA server is pretty easy. Setting up the cache is a little more involved because you have to have the machine and everything in order to hold the number of triples that are involved. But if you set up your own, then you don't have those improvements you do That's correct. <laughs> Um, I'm interested in the cloning slash copy cataloging that you mentioned uh, in passing this. Um, are these minting new URIs for entities that already exist? Um, and is there a, an expected, is this expected to be used a lot? Um, I'm worried about sort of losing some of the advantages of having common links. So in a lot of ways, I think that would be better answered by Jeremy and Josh who are sitting right beside you, um, because this is going to be happening inside the Synopia system. I'm providing sort of the infrastructure that gives them the information so they can do something with it. And for the first work cycle, um, we will be, for any new entities, of course, we'll mint the URI for. Um, we are sort of taking a strategy uh, that for existing entities that are external to Synopia, uh, you'll be able to, as, as Lynette demonstrated, import it in, but we, we will uh, mint a new URI in Synopia and do a same ad relationship. Um, there's, uh, there's still some um, questions about going forward of, of what that would look like and maybe having better integrations with external systems that we wouldn't necessarily have to do that same ad relationship. But, that's sort of a, a future work cycle, but this is just a way for us to get some of this functionality at least in place, again, for people to start working on, and then and to, as, a, as a good iterative development strategy, then we can change basic people's feedback. That said, one of the things that I've done with the profile configurations is to create a translator that takes a profile definition and turns it into a Sparkle query. So once we've got live SP stores. If I get asked for an instance of a particular work, I, I, I have the Sparkle query to basically pull the entire record out as a graph and hand it across the board. Let's thank our speakers.